So welcome everyone to the AMS Retiring Presidential Address. My name is Ruth Charney and I'm the current president of the American Mathematical Society and I will be moderating this session. Before we get started, let me note that this lecture is in webinar format, so only the speaker and moderators can be seen or heard. We may have time for some questions at the end of the talk, so if you do have a question for the speaker, please use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen, not the chat. I will read out questions from the Q&A at the end of the talk. All right, so let's get started. It's with great pleasure that I welcome our previous AMS president, Jill Pfeiffer, here today. Jill is the Alicia Benjamin Andrews Professor of Mathematics at Brown University and is currently also serving as the Vice President for Research at Brown. Jill Pfeiffer's combined contribution to the mathematical community through research and service are quite simply astounding. She served as the founding director of ICERM, the NSF Institute for Computational and Experimental Research in Mathematics, then as president of the Association for Women in Mathematics, and most recently as president of the American Mathematical Society. Amazingly, she has been able to keep up a full-scale research program despite all of this, these service obligations. Her work in harmonic analysis, partial differential equations, and lattice-based cryptography is well known and has been recognized by numerous honors. In particular, she is a fellow of the American Academy of Sciences as well as a fellow of the AMS and of SIAM, the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. Jill made a significant impact on the AMS during her term as president, particularly in starting initiatives aimed at increasing equity, diversity, and inclusion. I became president-elect of AMS in February of 2020 during the second year of her presidency. Uh, needless to say, it's been a challenging few years, and Jill's leadership and guidance have been invaluable. She is a hard act to follow. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome Professor Jill Pfeiffer, who will speak to us today about regularity of solutions to elliptic operators and elliptic systems. Go ahead, Thank Jill. you. Thank you, Ruth, for that um, really uh, kind introduction. Hi, everyone. It's, it's really an honor for me to have this opportunity to give this address. And of course, it's been a great honor and privilege to have served the AMS as president and then past president until February of this year. So we're, we're gathering by, by Zoom. Um, it's not what the AMS had hoped for and planned so thoughtfully for, but I'm grateful for the heroic effort to make this meeting happen anyway. I have a few reflections on AMS before I turn to the math part of my talk, but I first have to acknowledge what we've been and are living through. What, what can only be described as layer upon layer upon layer of crisis and of loss of many things and people, the latest layer being the war in Ukraine. And all these crises, and I'm not gonna enumerate them, have had effects that we're going to be trying to understand and unravel for a very long time. So before I transition to a more ordinary and I hope positive set of messages, I would just like to pause for a really brief, silent moment to acknowledge what and who we've lost and to gather a little strength for the future. Thank you. Today, I primarily want to talk about mathematics, but I first want to call out some of the efforts by volunteers, governing members, and staff that came to fruition at AMS during this period in the past four years, in spite of all the challenges. And all of these accomplishments were made in service of AMS's mission to support, recognize, and advocate for research in mathematics. There's been some really exciting progress made possible by amazing philanthropic support to the society. The AMS launched a new journal, Communications. This is a diamond open access journal. It's free to authors and to readers, thanks to generous funding by a donor. Another generous gift from Philippe Tandor will support the Big Math Network, cultivating mathematicians' employment opportunities in big business, industry, and government. The AMS successfully completed its campaign for the next generation and launched a new fundraising initiative for the 2020 fund to support and promote the scholarship of black mathematicians. The Board of Trustees endowed the Clater Gilmer Fellowship to support black mathematicians. This fellowship is now one of three AMS fellowships. The others are the Centennial, 
on the Joan and Joseph Berman Fellowship for Women Scholars. The work of the Washington DC Office of AMS, now in a new location, not only continued throughout the pandemic, but stepped up with, I think, even greater urgency. And several of us had the opportunity to discuss AMS mission priorities with the Biden transition team and met with leaders in OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. The Hill visits, all of them virtual, actually increased. There were more than 75. Congressional briefings resumed with Cedric Blani's talk last year. And the AMS Council took some significant decisions. It added a sixth policy committee, the Committee on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion to its other five policy committees. Those five committees, education, meetings and conferences, profession, publications, science policy, they were formed 30 years ago to provide direction for AMS in specific areas that serve and support its mission. The council established in June, 2020, a task force charged with producing a report to help understand and document the historical role of the AMS in racial discrimination, in particular anti-Black racism. That report is available on the website and through its governance committees, the AMS is operationalizing recommendations and reporting to council on progress. Finally, internally, the AMS took huge steps to meet the technology demands of remote work and virtual conferences the process transformations that had to be made in the technology team and the meetings and conferences team and the math sign net group in order to continue to serve us mathematicians is, I'm sure it's something I had more of a glimpse into than many of you, but I do wanna express my gratitude to the staff for the huge lift and the successes in keeping these programs going, including the math research communities workshops for graduate students has been so impactful. So all these achievements and, and many more were, were made possible through the dedication and hard work of volunteers who, who work for events, conferences, who serve on committees, who help AMS in governance through policy committees or running for election. And of course, hard work of AMS staff in Ann Arbor, DC and Providence. On a more personal note, this period that I served as president of AMS was both harder and more gratifying than I imagined it was going to be. It was hard because we were all so stressed and isolated in spite of Zoom. So crises can, can and do bring people together, but they also expose fragility. And that fragility was apparent when some of our steps forward at AMS were also accompanied by self-inflicted wounds and miscommunications. It was more gratifying too than I imagined it would be. I had the opportunity to work in policy committees, council and board of trustees with so many talented, dedicated, caring people, people that really cared about mathematics and about this organization. I had the opportunity to serve on the AMS National Awards Committee to help mathematicians achieve recognition in the general scientific community. I participated in advocacy efforts and gave a congressional briefing and I helped drive some initiatives that I felt or hoped would enable AMS to be a stronger society and to better serve its mission. Also during this period, I had the personal good fortune to be able to carve out a little time, not enough, to do what I love, to think about math with my students and collaborators. And so I'm going to try to explain some of the ideas that kept me going during that period. Uh, I was going to say made me happy, but I can't say that in front of a math audience. We all know what the ratio of frustration to satisfaction is in our research. But I'm going to take this opportunity to start um, sharing my screen with some slides. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about this algebraic condition called P ellipticity, which plays a role in some problems in analysis and PDE. And I want to tell a general audience about this because it's an algebraic condition that's proven really pretty useful. It's pretty recent. And I just wonder whether a more whether people have seen it before, or whether it could be useful more broadly. But I, I'd also like to give a lot of background to explain this relationship to a, a, an old concept that has been so fundamental in, in, in partial differential equations, which is the concept of ellipticity. 
So I'm going to jump in, and I do hope this is accessible to to a general audience. Um, we'll, we'll see if uh, good intentions translate to to decent outcomes. I definitely want to avoid that perfect storm of you know a uh, point where you know um, everybody who knows what you're talking about is is utterly bored, and those who who don't are utterly confused. So we'll see how it goes. Okay, so the plan for this lecture is to first give some background. Uh, I really want to, to, to bring people up to speed on some concepts that are basic to, to, to elliptic, uh, second order elliptic PDE. I want to talk about the, the condition, this algebraic condition of P ellipticity that was introduced in 2017 by uh, my collaborator, Martin Dindosh and me, and independently by um, uh, Carbonaro and Dragicevich, which is a, a fun, fun story. So this is, a, as I had mentioned, it's an algebraic property of complex matrices and also matrices with entries or matrices. And so that's correlated with systems of, of, of equations. And then I want to describe how we've used this concept in PDE. It's been useful in solving a variety of problems, boundary value problems, things related to holomorphic functional calculus and, and bounds for bilinear forms. This part will go fairly quickly, I think. Okay, so let's go back to Hadamard's classification of linear PDE in 1908. So this was based on um, characteristic polynomials. And we're looking at, say, second order PDEs, second order PDEs that is, we have two, two derivatives. <clears throat> and uh, the, the buckets are elliptic, where you should be thinking about Laplace's equation, which is the steady state temperature distribution. Parabolic, we can think about the heat equation, heat flow, and hyperbolic, the, the wave equation. And together, these three categories contain many equations that arise in physical phenomenon. Um, and it, but it's not every second order equation that falls in, in one of these buckets. So the um, principal term of a second order uh, PDE is uh, this one here. It's the one with the two derivatives. And, and this principal term, there might be lower order terms, but this principal term gives rise to a bilinear form where you replace the derivatives by a vector, by the ith component of a vector. And now if there exists a, a lambda, a real lambda, such that um, this condition of positive definiteness holds and the equation is called elliptic. And so in other words, this, this bilinear form is really very, acts very much like an inner product of the vector C with itself. And the structure of, two, of equations in two variables where ellipticity translates to this condition b squared less than 4ac gives rise to the, to the name ellipticity. So, so we're looking at um, we're looking at second order partial differential equations in n variables. And so they are, they are written in this form where this derivative di acts on the whole on the whole term aij dj. Again, if the equations are complex variable, complex value, then ellipticity uh, means that the real part of the complex inner product is, behaves like a real inner product. Okay, so our classic example of an elliptic equation, in this case with constant coefficients, is Laplace's equation. And so here the matrix A, I, J is just the identity. So the coefficient matrix of an elliptic equation might have variable coefficients and typically does in this case where X ranges over the same domain, some domain in Rn. And in this case, we're gonna use the term ellipticity to mean uniformly elliptic with a lambda, a parameter lambda, which is this parameter back here, which does not depend on X. So there's one lambda that works no matter what, what the variable X is. Okay, so in other words, the variable coefficient matrix Aij is elliptic when all of its eigenvalues have the same sign and are bounded strictly away from zero. It's sort of uniformly positive definite. So when we talk about classical solutions to these um, PDE, what we mean is a 
you know, is a, a function which has two continuous derivatives, right? That's the C2 part. And because, you know, we're going to be, we need to be taking, you know, two derivatives at least of the solution. So we need, we want, so a classical solution has two real derivatives. But, but there's an improvement that comes with, with this assumption that you've got a C2 solution. The improvement is that, that if the matrix happens to be have derivatives of all orders to be smooth, so that's the C infinity part, then the solution not only is C2, you start with C2, you say, I've got a C2 solution. You can actually improve, show that it has this improvement in regularity. It too has derivatives of all orders. So this notion of sort of self-improving, you know, from one property, you use something about the equation to, to say, to get a, a, an, an increase in regularity is something you've seen before in the context of complex variables, right? A differentiable function of a complex variable actually has derivatives of all orders. At the same time, if you have a harmonic function that is a solution to Laplace's equation, it's actually not just, doesn't just have two derivatives, it's actually real analytic. So a harmonic function. How do you know harmonic functions? They're the real or imaginary parts of functions of, of analytic functions of a complex variable. And here's a sort of more technical self-improving quality. And I, I, I want to try to explain one thing about this. So a function in a Sobolev space has higher integrability. So here we have a function which is square integrable, and it has a derivative that is also square integrable. But this derivative doesn't have to be uh, doesn't have to be understood as a real derivative. It is a weak derivative in the sense that it acts like a derivative of W when you integrate it. It has, it satisfy, these weak derivatives satisfy all the properties that differentiate, that diff real derivatives satisfy product rules and chain rules, but they're just measurable functions that live in a Lebesgue space. They're not, they, they don't come from the limiting relationship that, that, that gives you a real derivative. And, and so what this self-improving um, uh, inequality says is that if you have a function which is square integrable, but it has a weak derivative that is also square integrable, you can get some higher power of integration here. That's the self-improving. And so this notion of weak derivatives turns out to be really important because it allows you to, find, to define something called weak solutions, which gives you a sort of leg up, a starting point when you're trying to solve your, your, your PDE. Okay, so, so I want to try to explain what we mean by a solution to this elliptic equation when you can't actually place this derivative on A. You can't actually differentiate Aij because it it doesn't have derivatives. It's not even necessarily continuous. It's just a, some bounded and, and measurable function. Another way of thinking about this, if this is totally unfamiliar, is that what we're, what we're looking for is a way of defining solutions and proving properties of them that don't depend on how smooth the matrix is, that don't depend on any smoothness parameters, any measure of, 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 of how many derivatives this has. And we're going to understand what it means for a solution to this equation without actually having to differentiate the coefficient. So what, is, what, what are we going to say? What does it mean for this equation, which is what, in divergence form? So I'm writing this as divergence of the vector A acting on gradient of U, which is the same as what I've written up here. So this equals zero means that if I take this quantity and I test it against any phi and I integrate that, I should get zero. But now we're going to take this to be the definition of what it means to, to be equal to zero. And since we have a, we're going to test this against functions that are zero in the boundary, we're going to be able to integrate by parts and put the derivative on phi and say, this is what we mean by, by saying that, that this operator acting on u is zero. That when we take the 
a the vector a grad u and we test and we pair it with the gradient of phi and we integrate we always get zero see that does not require any any differentiation on a and again sort of in this integration by parts gives us these weak solutions okay so with this definition and in virtue of the ellipticity condition we can we can invoke some some results some theorems and functional analysis to get a hold of something called a weak solution, something that lives in, a, in the space of square integrable functions whose, whose weak derivative is also square integrable. So it's not a real solution. It's not a function that has two derivatives and so forth. That's just some element of, uh, of a Hilbert space. And, and, and where we're using ellipticity to grab a hold of our solution is to say that this, that because of ellipticity, this pairing A grad U paired with grad U really behaves like the inner product of the gradient with itself. It's really, it really is bounded from above and below by terms that look like this. So it's, a, it's an inner product. So I'm, I'm skipping over the, of course, the, the functional analysis that leads to it, but what, I, but I'm, what I'm really trying to home in on is where, where we get a hold of uh, our first approximation to, to a solution. Like it, it lives in some, it's a measurable function that lives in a Hilbert space. It doesn't, it's not necessarily continuous and cer or certainly differentiable. So the Georgie Nash Moser theory of this mid 50s, 60s is, is a truly remarkable set of results and they were, it's all independent. So there's a paper by DeGiorgi, there's work by Nash, and there's work by Moser and it's all separate, but it all, it all leads to this result that is, um, that's really pr uh, a pretty remarkable that says, okay, you've got an equation like this that you're writing in divergence form you know, so there's a structure here, right? There's a, you know, the structure is that you take the divergence of this matrix acting on this gradient and that's equal to zero in that, in that sense, in that weak sense where you integrate it against gradient of phi. So what this, what this remarkable set of results shows is that solutions you know, that, that start out just being measurable functions that live in a Hilbert space have to actually be continuous. And in fact, they have to be, they have to have a rate of Helder continuity, which means that there exists an alpha so that when you measure how, you know, continuous this function is, you're going to get some rate of continuity that, that, um, that, that is governed by um, a power alpha. And this is called being a C alpha. Now, DeGiorgi, I was maybe is the least well known of the of this three, but you know, he, his um, he did a, he was an incredibly creative um, mathematician who who did a lot of foundational work in geometric measure theory, um, uh, minimal surface equations, and his his motivation for the study of the regularity of solutions to these equations was initially driven by Hilbert's nineteenth problem. So so Hilbert's nineteenth problem asks. Are solutions to minimizers in the calculus of variations analytic, if the data is analytic? So it's a it's a regularity problem, but it's you know to to the to you know, to to one extreme with talking about analytic solutions. So what kind of min, what are we talking about minimizers in the calculus of variations? We're looking at a functional that has this form. We have a domain. We have a collection of of, of functions w that maybe satisfies some kind of bound condition on the boundary of the domain. We're plugging them into this functional and we're looking for the minimizer. And the minimizer in, is, in this class of functions is gonna be a solution to one of these divergence equations. Divergence F prime acting on grad W is equal to zero. So here's a concrete example. The concrete example is, suppose that you're, you're um, your, your integral is grad w squared. That's what you're trying to minimize, trying to minimize the energy over this domain. And then in that case, your minimizer will satisfy Laplace's equation, 
So De Georgie reduced this problem, Hilbert's 19th problem, to a step that required bootstrapping the regularity of, a, of an equation of this form, divergence A acting on gradient of U equals zero, where the matrix A was one of these elliptic, but only bounded measurable coefficients, right? It was not one of these, you can't take the derivative. And so, and so you know, DeGiorgi started with a weak solution in a sublef space and needed to actually prove that you could bootstrap this regularity and show that actually you had a Helder continuous function here, where in fact, the rate of continuity, the alpha, only depends on the ellipticity parameter, the, the lambda for the matrix. And one concrete motivating example for DeGiorgi um, in particular was this minimal surface equation. Nash uh, independently and at the same time as Georgie and with an entirely different method of proof found the same result, this time for parabolic divergence form equations. So a parabolic equation has, the, has this form. So this, this part is the elliptic equation, but we're going to subtract that from d by dt, a time derivative. And so Nash's result for equations like this also imply the same result for the elliptic case in the steady state where t is equal to zero. But he was motivated in, you know, by an entirely different collection of problems. He's motivated by, by um, understanding the flow for viscous compressible heat conducting fluids, which is really a nonlinear parabolic system. And he had to study the equation case first. So, so guided by, by physical in intuition as he records in his paper, inspired by diffusion and Brownian motion and the flow of heat, he proves essentially the same result, the, the, the improvement of regularity from weak solutions to actually held or continuous solutions for parabolic equations. And then Moser gave yet another proof, this time using a technique, a bootstrapping technique known as Moser iteration. Okay, so we want to show, take our, our function, which is a weak solution. It starts out just being square integrable, lives in a Hilbert space. And we want to say that it's bounded. And then even more than bounded, it's, it's held or continuous inside this domain. And so Moser iteration starts sort of steps up to this L infinity uh, case gradually, step by step, by going from higher and higher LP. We're in L2, we're going to get a higher LP integrability, like you saw with the Sobolev um, inequality. We get even higher and higher, and then finally up to L infinity, and then bootstrapping that onto to, to Helder continuity. So most this Moser iteration technique turns out to be important, and it's also something that we leverage when we're looking at our P elliptic equations. So the De Georgie Nash Moser regularity theory just opened up a whole field, you know, not just the, the for these nonlinear equations like the minimal surface equation, but also for for linear um, divergence form equations uh, where you're you're looking at boundary values. And so, you know, the classical sort of Dirichlet problem for an equation like this in a domain omega is to seek solutions which are continuous up to the boundary if the domain, if the data is continuous on the boundary. And we know that even if we start with a weak solution, we, we have, um, we have you know, a rate of Helder continuity inside the domain, but the classical Dirichlet problem is a boundary value problem. It actually goes to the boundary. So we have some, some more work to do to be able to solve this. And the modern theory, you know, that has its origin in Hardy spaces of analytic functions and harmonic uh, function theory, we're asking, when do we have existence and uniqueness of solutions where we don't, where we, we don't, the data is not necessarily continuous, but it lives in some Lebesgue space with, uh, with respect to a, a natural surface measure that exists on the boundary of the domain. And we're going to measure that data 
in this LeBeg um, LP space. And we're gonna ask for existence and uniqueness of solutions with respect to that measurement of, of, of LeBeg integrability. And in particular, we're gonna to have to add some kind of condition on the coefficients because bounded and measurable coefficients alone will not allow us to solve problems like this. We have to have some kind of condition. We wanna know how does, it, how does this precisely depend on properties of these coefficients? So I wanna switch now to talk a little bit about complex matrices because everything I've been talking about is for real, is for the case of real divergence form elliptic equations and because they enjoy many of the properties that harmonic functions enjoy, the, the maximum principle, um, the maximum value of these functions is taken on the boundary, the Harnack principle, every positive solution to one of these real elliptic divergence form equations has comparable values and compact subsets. That's what Moser used to get his um, iteration scheme all the way up to L infinity. Uh, boundary measure. If you want to recover a solution from, and you know it's boundary values, then if your solution is a harmonic function, you, you integrate this against a harmonic measure and you recover the solution. There's an analog of that boundary measure for these general real divergence form elliptic equations. But none of these properties hold for complex elliptic equations where the matrix might take on complex values and the solution does, or even for real elliptic systems of equations. There's no maximum principle, there's no boundary measures. So I want to introduce this um, uh, concept, this algebraic concept of p-ellipticity. So let me tell you where it came from really for, uh, for us, for um, my work with uh, Martin Dindosh. In the mid 2000s, Chade and Mazia defined a notion, um, LP dissipativity. It, this was motivated by their work on uh, trying to understand some properties of this operator, uh, which the semigroup operator, which is generated by one of these divergence form elliptic operators with a matrix A. But here the matrix A could take on complex values. Um, and so they're asking some questions about this operator, um, these operators, which were sort of always true for real operators, but were not always true for complex value operators. Um, so, so what, what Dindosh and I did was, was consider what we called a strengthening or elliptic strengthening of this notion that they defined this LP dissipativity. And, and here is one way to define this. And I will introduce another way that will look a little more algebraic and, and easier to, you know, but, but, but let me introduce this because this was our um, first elliptic strengthening of this Chaldea and Mazian notion. So I'm gonna define a matrix, so this is a matrix A and it's got complex coefficient, complex valued coefficients. And I'm gonna define this to be P elliptic if this quantity, um, mu sub a, which I'll make a remark on in a moment, is bounded from below by a quantity that depends on p. Okay, so that's so this is the relationship between uh, the matrix, something about the matrix A and the value p. Now you can see that from the way that this is written here, we 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 do have something that looks like classical ellipticity coming into play here, but, but there's more going on. What, what mu of a is measuring is a, is a relationship really between the real and, and imaginary parts of the matrix A. And it's doing, it's, it's measuring this in a very precise way. And the P ellipticity condition is also a, a very precise quantitative way of, of saying how this is bounded away from, from zero. Okay, so that's one definition. The condition was actually formulated independently and, and, and termed p-ellipticity. Um, so we're borrowing Carbonaro and Dragicevich's term here. And they defined it as follows. So, let, so p is a, a number between one and infinity. And now we're gonna define a map. 
on complex vectors. And this map is going to send alpha plus I beta to alpha divided by P and then beta divided by P prime. So what's P prime? Well, P prime is called the, the conjugate or dual to, to the number P. Um, it's it's in, in, in Lebesgue measure theory, the LP spaces and the LP prime spaces are dual to one another. So it's a kind of dual index. If you know P of course is here below two, then P prime is, is up here above two. And so what, what Carbonaro and Dragicevic show actually is that the matrix, the matrix is P elliptic, meaning it satisfies this definition. If and only if it satisfies this algebraic condition. So we're taking the complex inner product of the matrix A acting on C instead of with C itself, which is the classical ellipticity condition, we're taking this inner product with this uh, skewed, you know, complex vector. And then we take the real part of that and that's what behaves sort of like this inner product. So that, so those two conditions turn out to be equivalent. Okay. So they each have advantages. Um, the advantage of the definition in terms of mu is the separation of A from P, right? It, so we have, a, we have a measurement, a quantitative measurement of the relationship between the real and imaginary parts of the matrix A and, 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 and a comparison with a value of P. Interestingly, this, this quantity one minus two over P is exactly the same as one minus two over P prime whenever P prime and P are dual indices. And so that means that whenever A is P elliptic, it's also P prime elliptic. And so it's also P elliptic for all the P's in between and so in fact, when a matrix turns out to be, when, you, when you, a matrix is P elliptic, then actually it's, it's, you know, it's elliptic in a whole, it's P elliptic in a whole range around, around two. So by in virtue of being elliptic at one point, it is in the other point and then all, all in between. Okay, so that's what you can see from the first definition. And, and also, if you unravel the, the definition of mu a little bit more, you will see that as p goes, p naught goes to one, which is the same as p naught prime going to infinity, that the matrix becomes closer and closer to being real. And so in fact, p naught is equal to one if and only if the matrix is real. So this is a very precise measurement of how far your matrix is from being real in some sense that has to do with forming inner products. Now, the advantage of, of this condition, however, is that you know when P is equal to two, so is P prime. And so this condition is truly an extension of the classical ellipticity condition, which is the same as this two ellipticity that I've defined. So P ellipticity is a true extension of this classical ellipticity. All right, so that's, that's the definition. Now it's, it's proven um, to be remarkably useful to investigate what happens if you assume this condition on complex matrices. And Carbonaro and Rogicevich gave several examples of the significance of this in LP contractivity of semigroups and the whole morphic functional calculus. And they proved um, dimension-free bounds for bilinear forms. Let me just um, point out that when you look at this operator e to the minus t la, when you look at this semigroup and you apply it to a function, then the resulting, the resulting um, function of, of, of a variable x and t is actually a solution to a kind of heat equation generated by this um, operator L sub A. Other uses of P ellipticity have come up in the theory of degenerate elliptic equations that arise 
in connection with domains with low dimensional boundary and the work of Fenoy, Mebaroda, and Zhao. So, so it, it's it's been it, it's proven to be to be a useful addition to the to the um, um, portfolio of things you investigate with with complex coefficients. Oh, I wasn't going to show you that yet because it looks so so daunting. I was going to set it up, but I also fear that I might be be losing some time on it. So I'll, I'll, I'll go to this slide, but I'll just try to direct your attention to one thing to look at so it doesn't appear quite so daunting. So so what, what Martin Dindosh and I used this condition to, to prove was, was something like, like what Mosier did in his iteration scheme, you know, except that, you know, as you iterate, you know, with Moser, you get all the way up to L infinity because your solutions, there's a maximum principle and, and you, you bootstrap this method, you can go all the way up to L infinity. But what happened with, with a, a complex matrix is you don't have maximum principles and you're not going to get higher and higher integrability of your solution all the way up to a L infinity. So I just want you to, 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 to look at this particular statement, which says that if you start out with a solution, you have a matrix, which is P elliptic. You have a solution, which just belongs to, uh, you know, a Sobolev space. And then, you know, that means that it's going to be square integrable. So, so this, this quantity here, makes makes sense because it, we're taking the, squ the square of you and, and where that's where it lives. It lives in the space L2. And, and what P ellipticity allows you to do is say, well, actually you get higher and higher powers of you being integrable and you can go all the way up to a little bit past P and that, and that P is exactly the place where the matrix stops being P elliptic. So, so this is a higher regular, re regularity. And what we did is essentially, is essentially equivalent to running the Moser iteration argument as far as you can. And then that's, that gives you this, this range. We also uh, applied this to the case of systems. Now, so a complex coefficient equation is you know, can be you, you can take the matrix A and you can separate into its real and imaginary parts. Then you can separate U into its real and imaginary parts. And then you can write this as a system of equations for the real and imaginary parts, and it will be a certain kind uh, have a certain structure. So it, it, so it makes sense to think about complex equations as a certain form of a system of equations. And so we we then considered with with Jung Gang Li here at Brown, a, a, a p ellipticity condition for systems of equations, and and even for real elliptic systems, you know, we lack all of the tools of elliptic equations, weak maximum principles and Helder continuity. But the you know the twist is that for systems, there's several notions of ellipticity that are actually important. There's a strong ellipticity. There's an integral ellipticity, which allows you to run the functional analysis arguments that lead to existence of weak solutions. And then there's a weak or Legendre Hadamard um, ellipticity. So we formulated these three notions of P ellipticity for systems and proved some, the corresponding relations and applied this to study some, some specific systems of interest. And we investigated the consequences of this, applied it to some particular systems that, that come up in, in elastostatics, like the Lame system, where the parameters lambda here and, and mu actually um, ha have to do with the, 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 our physical parameters having to do with the material. And so I, I'm just going to say one more thing about one, one way in which we use P ellipticity to, to sort of bootstrap uh, something that is normally not, you know, you're not able to bootstrap in a complex coefficient setting. So, so in the real case, if you can solve one of these boundary value problems where the data belongs to LP, then up here at L infinity, you have solvability because you have a maximum principle. Your solutions are in your solutions in your domain are bounded by their boundary value, the maximum of the boundary value and on the boundary. 
And so there's a, you know, you can, there's a method of interpolating to get solvability for all of these ranges in between. But now if you're in the complex case and you have solvability, say in some LP like L2, you don't have anything to interpolate with. You don't have a maximum principle. You don't have any, you don't have any, anything to, to bootstrap this solvability. And so what we did is prove a sort of general extrapolation of this of Dirichlet problem by, by, by showing that once you had solvability in L2, if you have, uh, if your matrix is P-elliptic, you can, you can bootstrap this all the way up just a little bit past P, just as, 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 as we showed in this regularity problem. So um, I, this, this work is, is, is collected in, in a series of, of papers that um, ex explored various aspects of, of uh, the real um, theory, but in this complex setting under the assumptions of P-ellipticity, the extrapolation, the systems, uh, a perturbation theory and so forth. And, and I really, I, I wanna say that I, I, I truly appreciate the, the work that, um, that, I, that I did with, with, um, with uh, Martin Dindosh and, and, and Zheng Gang Li on this, because this was, this was really a, a very sort of new and exciting thing for, for me to be working on during, this, uh, during a time that was uh, actually pretty challenging. And so I, I'm grateful to my collaborators and I'm grateful to you for, for listening to, to, to this talk today. And um, if you have any thoughts about this, condition on P-ellipticity, I, I would love to hear that. And I'm going to end now in case there, there might be a, a question or two. Thank you very much, Jill, for a very interesting talk.